this Sunday again, we're going to hear from Pastor Ephraim. Uh, Pastor Ephraim is a friend of Epiphany. He's been um, a part of our worship services in person multiple times. He um, is an, a former colleague of our pastor, Kevin Farmer. He uh, planted a church in North Minneapolis years ago called Sanctuary Covenant Church. And uh, that's where he and, and Kevin were pastoring together. And then has now moved on to some kind of national level roles uh, with a couple of different ministries and is back pastoring a church now in Sacramento, California called Bayside Church Midtown um, in, in Sacramento, California. Uh, he, I've been, I've been uh, moved and, and encouraged by his, his messages to this point. And I'm excited to hear um, as he shares from us today really around the idea of joy and gratitude and a, and a kind of, um, I guess it's a, it's a good connection to our, our last Sunday of Advent where we, we celebrated joy together. So um, here's Pastor Ephraim Smith, and uh, I pray that, that you are blessed by the sharing of the word this morning. So for today's message, we're going to be rooted in the book of Philippians. Join me in Philippians in the New Testament. That is where we're going. All right. Philippians chapter one. We're going to begin with verse three. Philippians chapter one, beginning with verse three. Paul is writing and he says this. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart and whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. From this text, I want to speak to you on the title, The Practice of Gratitude. The Practice of Gratitude. God, I pray that this would be your message, that ultimately you would be speaking, and I would just be the vessel, the vehicle that you decided to use to say what you want to say. To these, your beloved children, my sisters and brothers. God, I desire to be obedient to your word. So please let it be done. In Jesus' name, amen. The practice of gratitude. You know, um, in this season, in life in general, we have to learn how to be grateful in spite of the circumstances. No matter what we're going through, if we are going to be imitators of Christ, if we are going to grow as followers of Christ, if we are going to be the vehicles that God uses to bring the love, the grace, the mercy, the truth of Christ into a broken world, you and I have to grow grow, we have to orientate ourselves to be grateful no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in. I am fortunate that I'm a product of a grateful family. Um, when I would go down uh, to Monroe, Louisiana in summers as a kid growing up, uh, even though I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, my dad is from Louisiana. And when I would spend time with my grandparents outside of Monroe, Louisiana, they lived on a cotton field at the end of a dirt road. They were not wealthy, but yet I sensed a thanksgiving in their spirit. I sensed a grateful 
faithfulness on the inside of them. I knew that when I left the city of Minneapolis and I ended up at my grandparents' house and I would visit cousins in the community, uh, many of my family members lived in houses at the end of dirt roads. Uh, they didn't have street lights like I had growing up in the city. They didn't have the concrete pavement. They didn't have the tarred pavement. There, there were dirt roads and, and fields and, 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 and in these small houses that didn't have central air condition, didn't have the, the heating system that I had in my house because I was in Minnesota, I still could sense because of their connection to God, their thanksgiving, their gratefulness. And there were things when I would go visit my people in the South that even though the Civil Rights Act had passed, the Voting Rights Act had passed, there were still things going on where you could feel the brokenness, the division, the ways in which things still weren't right across race, uh, across the railroad tracks, things weren't right. But even though my grandparents, family members, they were still living in conditions where you could tell that there was residue left from Jim Crow segregation that did not stop them from praising God. It did not stop them from having a hallelujah, a thanksgiving in spite of in their souls. I realize, sisters and brothers, that I have a heritage of joy unspeakable that I come from a people that in spite of broken systems, in spite of slave plantations, in spite of segregation, in spite of laws not uh, leading to their, their flourishing and their thriving and their equality in Christ Jesus, in the community known as the church, they found a hallelujah. They found a gratefulness. They found a thanksgiving. The question then becomes, what about you and I? Even though we find ourselves in this COVID-19 season, even though we find ourselves in racialized unrest and brokenness, though we find ourselves in deep political polarization, though we're in a, in a time that we did not expect where we're working from home or we're trying to figure out our kids being in school from home, we're, we're trying to figure out uh, how to stay safe and how to stay healthy and protect ourselves in this crazy moment we find ourselves in. In, are you still grateful? Are you still thankful? Is there a hallelujah on the inside of you? Especially in this holiday season. Um, I, I'm sure that there are families that their plans for Thanksgiving changed. Their, their plans for Christmas changing. Their plans for New Year's Eve changing. Everything pressing against you, wanting you to live in despair and disillusionment and brokenness. Yet our faith calls us to still be people of joy, people of thankfulness, people of gratitude. That's what I'm calling you to. No, more importantly, that's what God is calling us to is gratitude. You know, uh, in this holiday season, sometimes uh, it, it bothers me a little bit that, that it feels like in our nation, it's like we work hard to sanitize the holidays. We present these holidays and, and we present them as just like, almost like um, just these, these Disney myth, just great stories. So no matter the holiday, it could be, it could be whatever the, the, the national day we're celebrating. It could be 4th of July. It could be Memorial Day. It could be Veterans Day. It could be Thanksgiving. It could be Christmas. It's like we present them in, in just such a, a glorious positive, innocent, kind of mythical way. And, and you know, I, I get into these, these days. I mean, I honored my, my family members and, and friends that served in, in the military on, on Veterans Day. I, 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 I honored them through my social media posts. I mean, I look forward to the holidays. I look forward to Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's Day. But sometimes what, what bothers me is that we sanitize these holidays like, like they, they represent just good and 
and purity and innocent and, and nothing bad. And, and we just want to present our nation just in this very, just pure, innocent, great, good way. But when we do that, it takes away from how broken and sinful our world is. Because I love living in the United States of America. I do. But if everything in the United States of America is great, and if everything historically has been great and pure and innocent, why would we need Jesus? Why would we need the kingdom of God to come, to come on earth as it is in heaven? Because we live in a broken, upside down, sinful world. See, I don't need the holidays to be sanitized. I, I, don't, I don't need holidays to be innocent. You know why? Because I know the Holy One. If you're in relationship with the Holy One, you don't need the holidays to be manufactured in some comfortable, packaged, nice way for you. Because even when things aren't going the way we planned, we can find gratitude through our relationship with the creator of the universe, with the one who sent his son that we would be transformed and have new life. This is what we can learn from Philippians. And these few verses from chapter 1 of Philippians written by Paul, he is writing to an urban, multi-ethnic church filled with influential female leaders. And he's talking to them about how in the midst of external and internal opposition, they can have gratitude. They can have a heart of joy and thanksgiving. So uh, let me talk a little bit more about this Philippian church, this church in the city of Philippi. So this is what you should know about this church. First of all, this is the first church, the first Christian church that was planted on European soil. So uh, Philippi, it, uh, it's, it's located in what we would call Greece today. Uh, and so first church on European soil. This church was very compassionate and very generous. They were compassionate to Paul. When, when Paul was, was fruitful and flourishing and planting churches, and, and spreading the gospel. This was a church that was generous to him, that supported his ministry. But even when Paul found himself in chains, imprisoned, and, and he was in prison, uh, most likely in Rome, when he wrote this letter to the church at Philippi, um, they still were a church of generosity and encouragement to him, even when he was incarcerated. This church, like I said, was made up of very influential, powerful female leaders. We see women in this church who uh, probably were ministers and deacons. So you can read about um, Yodia. You can read about uh, Satiki, uh, who uh, were part of this church, these two sisters, along with other sisters that were ministry leaders in this church. But though that's all true about this church, this church also had some division. They had some quarreling, some tensions within the church, and they also had external opposition. I wonder if that sounds familiar. Uh, a church that has some tension and division and quarreling inside of it and also forces of marginalization and oppression attacking it from the outside. And it's in that context that Paul is writing to this church. And what I want to do is I want to go back to the verses that I read in chapter one of Philippians. And I, and I want to present this question, this question. Why grab a hold of gratitude in difficult times? Why grab a hold of gratitude in difficult times? times. Ah, I want to give you some answers to that question. So let's go back to the text. Philippians chapter one, beginning with verse three, says this. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ 
Jesus. Why grab hold of gratitude in difficult times? Why? Because grateful people work together. That what, what, what that means is you don't have the ability, I don't have the ability in isolation to, to sustain a life of gratitude. I can't sustain a life of joy, of thanksgiving, of gratitude on my own, isolated, and neither can you. How you and I sustain lives of gratitude and thanksgiving, no matter what, is we need an intimate relationship with God, and we also need to be in community with, in partnership with, together with other believers in Jesus. Stop trying to stay grateful Stop trying to stay positive. Stop trying to be thankful. Stop looking for a way to, to keep joy in your own power. To be a person of gratitude and joy, thanksgiving, you need God. I need God. I need Jesus. But also I need other people. I need other people that are attempting to walk with God just like me. Ah, how grateful people work together. Because when we are together as a people of gratitude, we become durable. Yes, there is durability when we are willing to stay connected to God and stay connected to one another. It, we, we are able to be durable. We can stand. We can be strong in the midst of adversity, in the midst of stress and anxiety. When it feels like opposing forces are coming against us, us. We were not meant to fight, to stand, to grow alone. We need God. We need each other. So there's durability, but we also need unity. <laughs> I, I, to be a person of unity, I need God. And to be a person of unity, I need other people that are desirous of unity as well. You won't have unity in the church just because we sing songs. You won't have unity in the church just because we all have a Bible. Uh, you, you won't have unity in the church just because I have a prayer and you have a prayer and they have a prayer. We have unity in the church when we are desirous to live out life together. And though we're not in a church building, that doesn't mean that we can't pursue togetherness. Oh, we, we, we are fortunate that we have technology that connects us in ways that we can still pursue unity when some of the ways that we're accustomed to coming together aren't options for us. So uh, grateful people work together because together gratitude builds durability, it builds unity, and it builds loyalty. Loyalty. First and foremost, our loyalty to God, our commitment, but then our loyalty and commitment to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Ah, if we really lean into this supernatural transformative togetherness, this connectedness, uh, that, that we, our gratitude will grow because we'll be reminded that we're redeemed. So no matter what's going on, if I remember redemption, I'm grateful uh, that God sought after me even when I wasn't seeking God. Uh, uh, when I think about reconciliation, that, that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and raise from the dead for me, that I could have new life, that I, that I wouldn't just be the walking dead anymore, just living on my, my own devices and, and leaning into my own stuff, that, that knowing that God loves me so much, that God would pursue me. I'm grateful for reconciliation. I'm, I'm, I'm restored in Christ Jesus. I'm grateful for restoration. Ah, and, and the fact that, that God's love and grace and power is for everyone who would say yes. It's supernaturally distributed out so that all that call on Jesus can be transformed.
Now, when you become grateful because of redemption and reconciliation and restoration and, and the redistribution of, of, of God's love and grace and mercy and truth, then you can become a person of redemption and reconciliation and restoration and redistribution. What I mean is you become generous, you become loving, you become forgiving, you care about other people living in brokenness and fallenness. You become so grateful that you don't just think about yourself. You think about others. Why I grab a hold of gratitude in difficult times? Grateful people work together. But also, grateful people build intentional relationships. Grateful people build intentional relationships. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Verse 7 says, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. Grateful people build intentional relationships. See, Paul didn't just go and plant a church in Philippi and then go about his, his next ministry assignment. Paul raised up leaders Paul planted churches and he intentionally stayed connected in order to continue to build the relationship. He continued to speak into lives. He stayed connected. See, um, when, when we stay connected, when we're intentional about building relationships, especially cross-culturally, remember now the church in Philippi was an urban multi-ethnic church filled with influential, powerful female leaders, females that were sharing pastoral shepherding responsibility with men. That's why when Paul's writing this letter, he's saying brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, because brothers and sisters were sharing pastoral leadership in this church. Men and women would have been deacons in this church. Men and women would have been uh, overseers in this church in Philippi. That's why you see uh, the names of women lifted up in in this letter, uh, in this book, in the New Testament, Philippians, because it was brothers and sisters, intentional relationships. See, I, I think the church can be more intentional today, more intentional about building relationships across culture. So even though right now uh, we are not sitting next to each other in a church building, are we still being intentional about building relationships? Who are you calling? Who are, who are you on the phone with? Who are you having a Zoom call with? Who are you emailing? Who are you texting? Who are you intentionally? What about old school? Write a letter. Could you imagine writing a letter to someone and someone getting a letter and being encouraged, being empowered, experiencing love because of your, because of my intentionality. See, right now we live in a world that's intentional about division, intentional about hatred, intentional about injustice, intentional about judging other people and looking at other people's uh, uh, frailties and not their own. That's, that's the broken world. But what about who the church it's supposed to be in a broken world. Ha! Ah, grateful people build intentional relationships. I told you that there was tension in, in this church community in Philippi. They, if you read into chapter 4, uh, you, you, you read about some of the sisters that were in leadership they were, they were arguing. They, 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 they were, there was division amongst them, and, and Paul is speaking to them. He's calling them to love one another. He, he's really calling them from going from a church to a community to a family. 
the family of God. Could it be that Paul was calling them into new identity in Christ? Maybe that's what we need today, sisters and brothers. We're finding identities in political parties. We're finding identities in the systems and ideologies and structures of this world. What about putting first and foremost our identity in Christ, in the Savior, in the Messiah, in the Reconciler, in the one who sets people free? What if we found our identity first and foremost in Christ and the kingdom of Christ? The kingdom of God. What if we found our identity first and foremost in our citizenship in the kingdom of God? Would that lead us to experiencing new community? Would that give us the experience of a new family, a supernatural transformative family to look at each other, uh, to call each other sister and brother and have a whole new revolutionary meaning? For that, ah, why grab a hold of gratitude in difficult times? Grateful people work together. Grateful people build intentional relationships. And finally, grateful people grow in love. Verse 8 says, God can testify how long for all of uh, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Grateful people grow in love. Sisters and brothers, every day is a new opportunity to grow in God's love. To be thankful, to be grateful just by reflecting on God's great love for us. But then out of the overflow of that gratitude, loving others loving our family members, loving our neighbors, loving our coworkers, loving those that we go to school with, loving our enemies, sisters and brothers, a revolutionary love, grateful people love, people that are truly thankful, people that have the joy of God on the inside of them can't help but love. So if love is not coming easy to you right now, if it is easier for you to live in unforgiveness, to live in sustained anger, to live in jealousy and envy, if it's easy for you to go on social media and talk bad about somebody, if it's easy for you to bash somebody right now, maybe you need to check where you are with God? Are you living too much in your own power and not in the empowerment of God found in Christ Jesus, the greatest example of God's love for us? Ah, grateful people grow in love. Every day is an opportunity in Christ Jesus to be more loving and less the other stuff it doesn't resemble God's love. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting here that Paul connects love with knowledge, which means the more that we are controlled by, governed by, empowered by God's love, the more our knowledge grows. Because could it be that when, when we are not operating in God's love, it impacts our thinking. Like the thoughts that we have, the things that we root ourselves in, I believe this and you're not going to change it. This is what I believe. I mean, you can have Christians that are so full of doctrine, so full of what they believe but how they live doesn't resemble God's love. You can believe a bunch of stuff about God and not be living out God's love in the world. 
That's why to some people, they just look at the church. They look at Christians and go, why would I want to be a part of that? I look at Christians and to me, they come across as judgmental, as prideful, as arrogant, as mean. Because you can believe and not be filled with God's love, with gratitude and thanksgiving. Ah, we need to be people of love and let love impact your believing. Let the love of God coupled with the word of God shape what you believe. And when that happens, the other thing that Paul puts in this is insight that you may be able to discern what is best. We, in some cases, as Christians, we're not discerning right. We are not seeing things in this world for what it really is because we're just going off of belief systems rooted in the systems and structures of this world instead of truly living the transformed life by being so governed and controlled by God's love that it transforms our thinking. Our mind is renewed. And so when we are committed to grow in love, we grow in the right knowledge. Our, our spirituality has depth to it. We are no longer in the shallow end of the Christian pool. We can go deep in living out the things of God because we have discernment. We're able to look at things that used to enslave us and go, no, I've been set free from that. Grateful people grow in love. And sisters and brothers, I just want to end on this. Verse 11 says, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Do you know that both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, justice and righteousness share the same root word? So you can't say righteousness without saying justice. And for the believer, for the Christian, for, that, for the person rooted in God's word, you can't say justice without righteousness, which means if you are practicing a form of justice that is not righteousness, that is not glorifying God, that is not bringing the kingdom of God to bear on brokenness, that is a worldly system of justice. And you need to know there is a distinction between the justice of God and versions of justice in this world. And so just saying justice doesn't make you righteous. Just saying you are committed to justice because you can be committed to justice in your own power, in your own thinking. And so when you are a Christian, when you are a believer, your life is bringing together, aligning, fusing righteousness and justice, justice and righteousness, which means in a broken upside down world, we have an opportunity to live out joyful justice which means you can pursue justice and not be angry all the time. You can pursue justice without living in unforgiveness. You can pursue justice and not be a person that wants to get revenge on people. I meet too many people that say they're about justice and they are angry, mean, broken, hurting people. And I understand it. Because if you're pursuing justice without Jesus, that's what you will be. You will be mad. You will be so broken all the time. Mean, you'll want revenge. You will be a hard person to walk alongside. But what is supposed to be unique about followers of Jesus is we have the ability in a broken world to pursue justice and have joy. Pursue justice and have thanksgiving. Pursue justice and have hope. Pursue justice and love our enemies. Pursue justice and stand strong. Pursue justice and be generous. Pursue justice and be compassionate. Pursue justice and be unselfish. This is the radical call upon the church. 
joyful, justice. Grateful people embody righteousness and justice. I pray, sister, I pray, brother, that no matter what we're going through in this broken world, that you and I would not lose our joy. You and I would stay grateful. You and I would keep a hallelujah on the inside of us, but we wouldn't do it alone. I pray that if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you would make that decision today, that you would say yes, that I cannot live life in my own power anymore. If you're already a Christian, but you can admit today that you've allowed yourself to be held captive to systems and ideologies and institutions that talk about God and talk about Jesus, but all that God and Jesus talk is just a cover for the pursuit of earthly power and platform. Maybe it's time to recommit your life to Jesus and be set free like you've never experienced freedom before. And I also pray that God would use you and I to be people of joy, peace, truth, righteousness, and justice in a world that needs it so much. God, let this be who we are. Invade us, God. Empower us, God. Let us have a joy unspeakable, undescribable, except through our revolutionary faith. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.